Now, a recent study just came out a few weeks ago finding that number has actually slid back even more. 93% of, of American adults have poor cardiometabolic health. So they have some degree of high blood pressure, insulin resistance, visceral adiposity, and the and and that was just going up until 2018. And so we we all know that what the pandemic did to obesity rates and uh, metabolic disease and so forth. So yeah, this is quite common, unfortunately. And so that's why I think it's really important that that people use a two pronged approach. And again, looking at uh, trying to exercise, trying to walk, trying to lift weights, because even if you're already fasting, the more exercise that you do, you actually increase and get more mileage from your fast. And so I like to share people one study that actually found they randomized people uh, based upon their body weight you know, to fast for different durations. And what one study actually found is that uh, people who are regular exercisers have a more statistically significant increase in the autophagy related pathways compared to people who fast for 36 hours that are overweight and don't exercise. So again, if you're big into fasting and you're like, I, did, I love this, my three day or five day fast and so forth. Well, you're actually going to get more mileage in terms of uh, autophagy and different uh, intracellular signaling pathways that will be increased if you become a habitual exerciser. And so that doesn't mean you need to be a gym rat. It just means you walk, you know, after meals in particular, you, you do yoga, maybe you do gardening, whatever you like to do. And you can habitually do that. I think that's most important. That's fascinating research talking about the autophagy related to the exercise. And I'd like you to expand upon that more for people that might not know what that word means. Yeah. So let's talk about what you're getting at there and, and why that's important. Yeah, excellent point, Jesse. So the term autophagy has been sought after in recent years because it's an intracellular cleanup process. And unfortunately, this process tends to decline with age and it's linked with the formation uh, of aggregated proteins that can cause uh, neurodegeneration in the brain and so forth. So as we age, our cells lose their ability to clean up intracellular debris. And so this process of autophagy is, is again, linked with uh, improving cellular function, particularly the defective organelles within the cell. So, you know, we all have trillions of, of cells and within those cells, we have very specific organelles, just like within our house. We have our furnaces, we have our hot water here, we have our dishwasher, right? Our cells are very similar and how our cells make and produce energy so that they can function so that your neurons can transform transmit light and, and you can create memories and so forth. Um, that is largely that energy to, to create, uh, to enable cells to function is derived from the mitochondria. And it turns out that as we age, our mitochondria can be kind of sort of rusty, uh, oxidative or free radical stress can damage the mitochondria. So we need to clean them up and we need to break down their component elements and reuse those elements to construct brand new healthy mitochondria. Well, uh, the process of autophagy really helps to clean up the mitochondria, clean up uh, you know damaged, deranged proteins, uh, glycated proteins uh, and, and uh, issues like that within within cells and on cells. So this is what's why autophagy is important. Uh, again, the rates of autophagy are, they're a little bit tissue specific. For example, more autophagy might be occurring in the liver in, when you're fasting compared to in skeletal muscle, right? So there is some tissue specificity here. It's not this on or off thing that is, it's been sort of oversimplified on the internet. But the nice thing is we can, we, we now know ways that we can improve this intracellular process. Uh, one study in June of 2019 found when individuals embark on just time-restricted feeding, and this was a feeding window that may not be practical for working parents and you know, like yourself with young children or, or myself, but it's just important to understand that just compressing your feeding window and eating between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., uh, and comparing and contrasting autophagy initiation proteins and transcription factors in that group compared to a group who ate identical numbers of quantity of energy, overall calories that was controlled in this study. What the researchers found is that when people just eat ad lib between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., the folks that ate earlier between 8 a.m. And, and 4 p.m. had a significant increase in, again, uh, gene transcription, so genes that are turning on to initiate these longevity pathways, uh, including but not limited to upregulating autophagy. And there was also a decrease 
in a, in a protein uh, known as mTOR that is linked with, excel when it's chronically overexpressed, mTOR, sort of like the, the opposite end of the spectrum compared to autophagy, uh, mTOR overexpression is linked with uh, cellular growth, cancer, uh, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and, and neurodegenerative diseases. So um, that early feeding window group noted a significant reduction in M mTOR compared to the ad lib feeding group that ate all day, uh, and then a significant increase in autophagy and other longevity and cancer um, preventative enzymes. So again, it's important to understand that we don't have to take these drastic measures. And that's why, you know, when I made that video, why I quit fasting, it's really why I quit extended fasting. Uh, be, because, you know, keeping in mind all these different factors, and if we're just consistent with our daily feeding windows, um, and our body fat is, is kept uh, in healthy levels from exercise, and maybe we don't need to rely upon these extended fasts as much. I'd be curious if it was further teased apart to see how much of that benefit came from the more narrow eating window versus having that earlier eating window. Because a lot of people who are intermittent fasting are skipping breakfast. And in this case, you're talking about eating that first meal of the day, having a breakfast, and then basically having an earlier dinner and then not eating later in the evening. I mean, it sounds like we're splitting hairs here, but it's a really great point, Jesse, because it's unfortunate a lot of people have gotten into fasting just, uh, and I understand just, it's easy to sk start sk skipping breakfast. It's harder to start your fast at four, meaning cutting off your feeding window or, or so, but there are actual health benefits linked to this. The closer that you eat before bed, you know, let's say you fast all day and you start feeding again at 4 p.m. and then maybe you have your last last snack or something at 10 o'clock and you go to bed at 11, right? Um, the closer that you're having, pushing those calories towards bed, the more likely you are to put on body fat. And this was, again, there was a recent study in, uh, it was fall of, I think it was 2021 or 2020, uh, where they randomized women to two different groups and had them have a 600 calorie snack in addition to dinner. Now they stratified people to either have that snack with their dinner, so they had you know energy again in this study was controlled, and then they had women um, not have a snack with dinner, but have these 600 calories sometime after dinner, so they could have it right before bed, an hour before bed, or whatever. And they they followed these women for eight weeks and found that the people, the women that were in the group that ate the 600 calorie snack sometime after dinner, but not with dinner, put on more visceral fat. And so there's a really uh, good thing to remember is you want to stop eating within six hours of your midpoint of sleep. Now I know people are like trying to do math, right? But just it's within basically four hours before you get to bed is, is roughly between three and four hours. If you can stop feeding, so it's fine. If you don't like breakfast and you're hearing Jesse and I talk about early time restricted feeding, you're like, I could never do that. I'm not a breakfast person. That's fine, but maybe start, instead of waiting until eight o'clock to eat, maybe wait until 11 or noon. And that's generally what, what I do. I'll start feeding around 11, you know, 11. And that's really generally when I start to get hungry because I get, again, I've gone for a walk in the morning, gone outside, exposed my retina to sunlight and so forth. And then try to have dinner earlier, like around six, and then just not have any snacks or things like that and um, go for a walk after dinner. And that's when the fast starts, right? So again, instead of thinking, I have to start my fast for breakfast, think if I eat earlier, that's the start of my fast. And again, that is linked with benefits there. And Jesse, just one more quick thing here that I think is important to understand is when we eat with alignment with our body's circadian clock system, we have other beneficial effects like improving sleep and in training this circadian clock system. So if we bookend our day with a bunch of calories, like you said, most people get into intermittent fasting, they're eating a big dinner and then they go to bed, right? And they fast all day. Well, your gut is actually from a circadian rhythm perspective, not in the most prime state to digest and break down and process all those calories that you ate. You know, our all of our you know, bodily systems from our pancreas to our stomach, to our small intestine, to our skeletal muscle, to the gonads, these are, these are all influenced by our circadian clock system. And the gut circadian clock shows that um, motility, peristaltis, uh, all the enzymes, the hydrochloric acid, the pepsin, the bile acids, all of these things are actually in their peak around the middle part of the day. Uh, that's when, you know, ghrelin levels generally are higher, leptin levels are lower. It's this hormonal sort of milieu that suggests that we should be eating as humans during that point of time. Uh, and so we, we wanna optimize and, and support and foster 
these peripheral circadian clocks, like the gut clock, like the clocks within the muscle and the pancreas, they are they influence and feed back into the central circadian clock. And, and this all comes back to helping support sleep. This is where a lot of people struggle in life is they're poor sleepers, they, they uh, are you know up late at night, they can't fall asleep, their mind is racing. So anything that we can do to help foster a good night's sleep is important. And, and structuring our feeding windows uh, associated with you know optimal circadian rhythm alignment helps with sleep and vice versa. So I think that's the, a, another big thing, if nothing else, is if you fast all day and have a big meal, not only does just from a, a mechanical standpoint, you have all this food in your stomach and your stomachs and, and intestines are trying to break it down it, while you're trying to sleep. And that's not a good thing. So you get better sleep if you eat earlier in the day as well. So what I'm hearing you say here is if you're not going to have that earlier dinner, because maybe like us, you mentioned having young kids, socially, it might not work so well for you. Make sure you're at least giving yourself four hours to digest before bed. Exactly. As at least the entry point step for people. Totally. And, you know, I understand the family dynamics. You know, I, I love family dinners as much as anyone and things like that. Um, and if that's in your kid, if kids are back late from soccer practice or baseball or sports or whatever, um, maybe you just have a smaller meal then and you make lunch or bigger meal and you can still eat with the family, but you don't have to have this massive meal. So that's another thing, but, but it also helps kids as well, you know, um, getting kids in the habit of eating earlier, uh, and, and so on. And so, yeah, it's a great, I think it's a great tool, Jesse, just something again to to think about there's apps of course i like the app zero have no financial affiliations with it but it's just easy hit that timer and then you're sort of committed to doing this and then when you're tempted to grab some cookies or ice cream or whatnot you're like well i already started my fast so i can't you know feed, you know start snacking so earlier when you talked about autophagy being one of the benefits of fasting and the influence of exercise pushing that earlier meaning you don't have to fast as long to start having that benefit how long are we looking? Somebody that is exercising on a regular basis, I know it's gonna, there's variability here, but for somebody who is exercising, how long do they need to fast to get that benefit versus somebody who isn't? Yeah, this is a phenomenal question. Well, that study that I was mentioning, and this was a, a really well-designed study in June of 2019, um, these people were only fasting for 16 hours. And they noted, uh, the scientists noted by doing muscle biopsies and uh, gene transcription studies and analyses, that there was a pretty significant increase in, in the associated, in the desirable pathways that are linked with fasting. So that's the the nice thing to think about is we we don't really... You know, I think there was this perception on the internet for several years that you have to eat once a day. That's it. You have to fast for 22 hours or 23 hours a day uh, to get the benefits. But that's really not what the human data suggests. And as I mentioned, you know, in that other study, comparing autophagy initiation proteins and all the gene upregulations in fit people who fast versus sedentary people who fast, uh, the physically active people get uh, a quicker induction um, in in terms of fasting. They don't have to fast as long to get some of these benefits. So that's the nice thing. I think a garden variety, you know, 14 to 16 hour fasting window, which is doable for working people, family people. Um, and you're not going to compromise athletic performance or things of that sort, uh, or, or decrease muscle protein synthesis or things like that. So I think that's the important thing. And again, we can accelerate this, right? Uh, let's, let's say, let's say you're feeding window. You're like, look, I, I, I can only fast for 12 hours because like, I love food, right? If you think of someone like that, or I'm worried about muscle loss or, uh, if I don't eat, right? So what can someone do? Well, you can accelerate the fast by, let's say you have dinner at six o'clock. You can go for a 20 minute walk after that meal. And what that's going to do is that's going to, you know, drive down that blood glucose and insulin, start to increase, you know, fatty acid uh, synthesizing or, or uh, oxidation uh, type pathways, which are all favorable. And that can accelerate your fast. And then you can also do a fasted walk in the morning, right? And, and so there's different tools that you can do to sort of um, accelerate the benefits of this. And that's where I, I think marrying the best of exercise with consistent regular feeding window compression is um, from a longevity perspective and overall health perspective, because look, it doesn't feel good when you know you're getting weaker, when you feel weak, and then you start to identify as a weak person. Then it gets to your head like, gosh, I'm aging faster than I thought. And, and that's not a good state. I think our mindset is really important. Uh, well, I know it is in our identity. 
as, asso- as it's associated with health and uh, health outcomes. So we want to feel strong. We want to be getting progress from our physical activity. And, and so marrying the best of those worlds, I think is great. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. There was this perception on the internet for several years that you have to eat once a day. That's it. You have to fast for 22 hours or 23 hours a day uh, to get the benefits. But that's really not what the human data suggests.